Today on the Medical Humanities Podcast, the top five medical myths and mistakes on film. The scene opens. The doors crash open. The viewer sees ceiling panels rolling by overhead. Anxious faces look down, and as the camera switches viewpoint, we see an unconscious, sometimes bloodied patient hefted onto a stretcher in an ER bay. Urgent voices issue commands like, prep for central line, type and cross six units, and others update everyone on the patient's condition, shouting out things like, BP-40 palp. The patient is hooked up to machines, and the incredibly good-looking doctors and nurses watch the vitals appear on the monitor. Oh no! Asystole! Someone shouts. And then, for the benefit of the viewers, says, Flatline! He's got no pulse. Out come the defibrillator paddles that have to be smeared with gel. The machine cranks up and some lucky actor gets to bellow, Clear! Before pressing the paddles to the patient and making him arch out of bed like he's been possessed by the devil. Sometimes the patient sputters to life. Sometimes he doesn't. If he doesn't, the doctor running the trauma will try ramping up the jewels and shocking the guy again, and again, before wiping his forehead with the back of his hand and sighing, I'm calling it, time of death, 4.06 a.m. Good work, everyone. It's exciting, and mostly correct. In 1987's Robocop, Director Paul Verhoeven actually hired a Dallas ER trauma team for the movie, letting them ad-lib Peter Murphy's trauma scene because they obviously sounded authentic. And even if it isn't completely correct, viewers know that it's correct enough. The speed, the urgency, the voices shouting, the vaguely familiar-sounding medical terminology like lidocaine, IV push, and stat, it all makes for a pulse-pounding scene our pulses, that is, not the poor guy on the screen. But fictional medicine doesn't always get things right. Naturally, the biggest defenders in this area are the perennially popular medical series like House MD, Chicago Med, etc. The series ER was written by the late Michael Crichton, who was a physician before he became a writer, and it remains one of the few shows that generally receives a passing grade from those in the know. But TV is what it is, of course, and no show will get everything right. In this top five list, I've intentionally left out the fictional antics of a series like House MD, because I don't think anyone really believes doctors could get away with half the stuff they do on that show. House would have lost his license a dozen times over for insulting patients and popping Vicodin like candy, and the whole gang would have certainly faced criminal charges for breaking into people's houses. No, doctors don't have the right to rifle through your house for clues, even if you're in a coma. I've also left out the fact that doctors and nurses usually don't have the time or inclination for romance with each other, and certainly not with patients, which is another license-revoking offense. And I don't even get into how impossible it is for a 23-year-old underwear model to be a surgeon. I've also included general mistakes about the human body, perpetrated by major motion pictures and TV shows alike, usually involving what happens, or more often what doesn't happen, but should, to the body under certain conditions. I've broken things down into five categories, which sometimes incorporate several egregious offenses. So, without further ado, number five, surviving explosions. You've definitely seen this. Think Die Hard, where Bruce Willis leaps over the side of the building just as the explosives detonate and take out the entire roof. Or any movie where people just manage to escape by flinging themselves out the window. Or worse, they actually get blown to safety by the force of the blast. Two of my personal favorites are Indiana Jones 4, where Indy survives a nuclear bomb by hiding inside a fridge, and The Girl in the Spider's Web, where Elizabeth Salander scores a trifecta of miracle survivals. She's shot, survives an explosion by leaping into a bathtub of water, and wakes up after what seems like hours of unconsciousness, without suffering any ill effects. More on the unconsciousness thing in a little bit. Sometimes, 
Rarely, a director will pay lip service to the physics of explosions and will have the characters suffer hearing loss, disorientation, unconsciousness, or obvious injury. In the movie No Time to Die, Daniel Craig's James Bond does get a bit dizzy and can't hear right for a few minutes after Vesper Lynn's tomb explodes in his face. But we almost never see someone actually die as a result of being too near an explosion. The reality is that it's not only the explosion itself that does the damage. Detonations cause a temporary spike in atmospheric pressure, called overpressure, which compresses whatever's around it and causes a blast wave that radiates out from the source. When this blast wave hits a human body, internal organs, especially those that are gas-filled like the lungs, are also compressed and then expand again due to the decrease in pressure that immediately follows. The shock wave goes through you, in other words, your organs ping-pong around inside you, your vessels collapse, your alveoli and eardrums rupture, you develop air emboli, it goes on. The polytrauma from multiple organ or organ system involvement leads to a complex syndrome of neurological consequences. And that doesn't even include the high likelihood of being hit by flying debris and shrapnel or suffering from heat, chemical or radiation burns. So how far away from the explosion do you have to be to survive it? It all depends on the original explosion. For a nuclear bomb, it's at least a few miles. For a grenade, the minimum distance is about 50 feet, although flying debris has to be factored in as well. The truth is, it's almost impossible to predict just what the actual safe distance of any bomb is, but it's certainly farther than John McClane was able to jump. Number four, falling from a height into garbage dumpsters, water, etc. This happens so often in movies and TV series, it's almost not worth pointing out a specific example. But I'll tell you my favorite one. In the movie Commando, Arnold Schwarzenegger manages to jump from the landing gear of a plane during takeoff and land safely in a reedy swamp. Let's just leave aside the impossibility of going from the pressurized cabin to the unpressurized nose gear, and the extreme unlikelihood of even being able to hang on to landing gear during a 200-mile-an-hour takeoff. The 150-foot drop to the swamp below would have been unsurvivable. So let's just deal with the height factor first. Whether you land in a bunch of reeds, a dumpster full of garbage, a plastic awning, or anything else, Falling from roughly 150 feet means a body the mass of Arnie's would have been traveling upwards of 65 miles an hour on impact. Can you imagine hitting anything at 65 miles an hour with just you and walking away? As Jerry Seinfeld once observed when wondering why skydivers wear helmets, if your chute doesn't open, the helmet's wearing you for protection. Falling from anything above 10 meters, or 30 feet roughly, is almost always fatal mostly because, even at that relatively low height, the average person is traveling at approximately 80 kilometers or 50 miles an hour when they hit the surface. Faster, if you weigh as much as Arnie. There are a few documented cases of people falling from hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of feet with no parachute and surviving. But in most of these cases, there was some sort of mitigating circumstance that may have helped, such as landing on a sloped angle, or hitting lots and lots of trees and heavy snow, or being cool-headed enough to land on your feet and immediately drop, tuck, and roll to dissipate some of the kinetic energy. And of course, most of the survivors broke all kinds of bones, <laughs> punctured lungs, etc. In some cases, no one knows why someone survived such a fall, which is why you can still read about their stories 70 years later. It's so unusual so miraculous, even, to wonder these people weren't investigated by the Vatican. So, what about a water landing? Why isn't falling into water a good idea? Doesn't the water break your fall? No. Hitting water from anything above 30 feet or so is like hitting concrete. In fact, in some circumstances, you're much better off hitting the ground than hitting the water. You need about half a meter or roughly one and a half feet, of give upon impact in order to avoid fatal injury. So landing on a grassy or snowy surface is your best bet. Water is virtually incompressible, and so there's no give when you meet it at speed. 
As skydivers like to say, it's not the fall that kills you. It's the sudden stop at the end of it. Water is also a very dense substance, and the greater the density of the surface you hit, the greater the acceleration and force. Think of it this way. You'd need to accelerate and displace a lot of water in a very short time upon entry. And the only thing you have to do that with is you, your very soft, squishy body. Three guesses as to whether you or the water absorbs the impact better. There are several other reasons an impact with water is deadly. If physics is your thing, check out the sonic shock wave your body creates upon contact with the surface of the water, or the way your kinetic energy bounces around every which way when you land. But you don't need to be an expert to understand the outcome. Anyone who has ever experienced the pain of a belly flop understands all too well that water is not your friend when you hit it with force. Something to keep in mind. Falling isn't the same as diving. Cliff divers, who can jump from heights of over 100 feet, are in top physical condition and learn special techniques for how to enter the water safely. Most divers enter the water like a streamlined arrow and maintain that posture even after the water makes their bodies want to spread out or ball up. Also, if you look carefully at videos of high diving competitions, often you'll see that bubblers have been added to the water to make it froth up a bit, thereby lowering the density of the water and making it that little bit safer on impact. Still, even trained Olympic divers can break bones performing dives from a 10 meter or 30 foot board. Number three, being knocked out for longer than 30 seconds. So many movies depend on a character being knocked out for a good 30 minutes or so, or even longer. And I don't mean chemically knocked out, as in sedated or inebriated. I mean hit on the head with a frying pan kind of thing. In Pulp Fiction, Bruce Willis and Ving Rhames were knocked out long enough for the pawn shop owner to drag both men down to the basement and then bind and gag them. In the 1970s TV show Mannix, the hero was knocked unconscious 55 times during the run of the show. He should have become a drooling idiot after about the fourth or fifth time at most. On the original Star Trek, you didn't even need to hit people on the head. A resounding karate chop to the trapezius muscle was enough to turn the lights out. If any of these events had actually happened in real life, these people would need immediate medical attention for traumatic brain injury. They aren't just knocked out, they're concussed, or are bleeding into their brain, or their brain has swollen so much it's herniating out through the hole in the base of the skull. Many boxers die after a knockout in the ring, even if they were only out for a minute or two. And many athletes who get knocked out a lot, like hockey and football players, suffer severe cognitive impairment. And the more times you get knocked out, the worse the impairment becomes. It seems like the writers of these scenes are commingling the effects of fainting which are generally harmless, with the causes of unconsciousness, which are not. Fainting, or syncope in medicalese, is a temporary lack of blood supply or oxygen to the brain, and it lasts only seconds. This can happen for a number of fairly benign reasons, such as a sudden emotional shock, low blood pressure, heat exhaustion, etc. And the body's very good at restoring that blood supply quickly. Some people faint and recover so rapidly that they don't even know they passed out. Fainting is usually no big deal, if it resolves quickly. Losing consciousness from a head injury for even a few minutes is a very, very big deal. After the break, the top two medical mistakes. Welcome back. We're down to the final two in our countdown of worst medical mistakes in movies and TV. We've talked about surviving bomb blasts, hitting the water from a great height, and being knocked out for hours with no ill effect. Now, let's find out about number two, childbirth. We all know that labor and childbirth is a painful, messy, often traumatic experience that can last hours and even days. But judging by television and movies, it can be over in a flash, especially after the water has broken. A mother's water breaks when the amniotic sac her baby is floating in ruptures, signaling the imminent onset of labor. Imminent may not be the right word. While it's important to have medical attention after the water breaks to prevent infection, it's not always the case that labor will begin immediately. It can take up to 12 hours for labor to begin after the sac ruptures, sometimes longer, at which point labor will likely be induced. 
Sometimes the water doesn't break until well into labor, or even after the birth. The French term encal means the baby is born within his amniotic sac. On TV, however, the water breaks and often the mother doesn't even have time to get to the hospital, delivering her baby in the car on the way there. Labor can be portrayed in a variety of ways, from a few small twinges to full-scale bloody war full of screaming and pushing and chaos. It just depends on how pithy the director wishes to be. The truth is, labor can vary wildly from mother to mother, and even from baby to baby. But generally speaking, it takes quite a long time. Most TV shows and movies need to speed it up, and so present a very condensed version of the whole process. In the season one finale of Glee, labor only lasted as long as it took to sing Bohemian Rhapsody. In most movies, you won't hear about and will certainly never see the afterbirth, or placenta, which also has to be delivered after the baby is born. It's what the cord that everyone likes to cut is attached to. And it's almost the same size as the baby. It's not pretty, let's face it, and most movies would gain nothing by showing it. They'd rather show you a sweet little infant all clean and dry, swaddled in blankets and handed over to the loving mom. It's just never, ever like this in real life. Newborns are covered in a cream-colored, viscous coating called the vernix caseosa. It's a greasy layer that forms at about the eight-week mark and protects the fetus from the surrounding amniotic fluid. After delivery, it further protects the little one's skin against infection. Some babies are slathered in this stuff. Some have very little. But it's always best to just massage the vernix into the baby's skin and not wash it off right away, as is typically done. Sometimes, if the mother has been torn during delivery, the baby may be covered in blood, too. Some TV shows will attempt to show this, but the vast majority stick with the clean and dry version of newborns. Babies born vaginally also tend to have slightly elongated heads from being squeezed through the birth canal. Babies' bones are soft, especially those of the skull. Have you ever touched that little soft spot on the top of a baby's head? It's called a fontanelle and it's one of six that make up the infant skull. All six eventually close up by about 18 months of age, but at birth, the flexibility of the soft bones allows for easier passage through the birth canal, and later to accommodate the growing brain. Trouble is, babies do sort of look like little coneheads when they're first born. Little coneheads covered in grease. This is not what most people think of when they imagine a precious little newborn baby. And so, fictional births often show infants that are actually a few weeks, and sometimes even months, old. You'll notice the infant looks remarkably large in those cases. But then, how many mothers are willing to hand over the infant they just birthed to a film crew? Hopefully not too many, so we can let that one go. And since most actresses who portray pregnant characters aren't actually pregnant, it's common to see the supposed new mother bounce back to her pre-pregnancy body within days sometimes hours. The reality is that pregnancy and childbirth often change a woman's body permanently. Her pubic bone does have to actually separate into two halves in order to deliver the baby's head, after all. And baby weight generally takes quite a bit of time to lose. It's easy to take off a pregnancy suit, after all. It takes a lot more time to adjust to a non-pregnant state after nine months of growing and carrying another person. And finally, the number one most egregious medical mistake made in the world of film. Cardiac emergencies. Oh boy, let's start with CPR. There's really only one thing to say about CPR on film. It's terrible. It's beyond terrible. It's about as ineffective as it could possibly be. And sometimes it's even performed on a conscious patient. It actually seems like the writers never even Googled CPR before writing their scenes. Sometimes it's performed too lightly, with tiny, ineffective little presses on the patient's chest. Real CPR can and does break ribs, so it's understandable that you can't go to town on your actor. But with CGI and all the special effects we have these days, including fake bodies, you'd think that movie makers would have come up with something a bit more realistic by now. Sometimes CPR is performed once or twice and then abandoned. CPR is a marathon, not a sprint. The rescuer essentially has to circulate the blood for the person without a pulse, which means a consistent rhythm of compressions forceful enough to squeeze blood through the heart. It's exhausting for the rescuer, 
but you really can't stop once you start, unless you hand the person off to someone else trained in CPR. This can mean minutes of around 100 compressions a minute. Think of the BG song, Staying Alive, with enough force to compress an adult's chest by about two inches. Often, CPR isn't performed at all, of course. If the story requires a character to die, the fictional medic will simply feel for a pulse at the throat and then look up somberly and say, He's dead, Jim. Even if the person just collapsed in front of them. Why bother with CPR at all, right? The guy had it coming. If CPR is performed on screen, ineffectively or not, it's often wildly successful. The person surges up, gasping and coughing, and all is right with the world. The truth is much more grim. 90% of people who suffer cardiac arrest in public will die, either on the spot or later in hospital, mostly from organ failure, from going too long without oxygen. Giving adequate CPR early can double or even triple their odds of survival. But here's the important point. Even the best CPR is only meant to keep blood circulating and to keep the heart in a shockable state. As I said, the rescuer is simply manually taking over the pumping of the heart for the person, not solving the underlying cause. Reviving someone from CPR in real life is rare, except occasionally in cases of lightning strikes and some electrocutions, where the otherwise healthy heart literally blew a fuse and could use an electrical jumpstart to fall back into sinus or regular rhythm. Some arrhythmias also respond well to CPR. The common theme here is that if a person's heart stopped because of an electrical impulse problem, sometimes it's relatively easy to get it started again. Otherwise, don't expect someone to sit up and thank you after a few chest compressions. You're just trying to keep them viable until they can get to medical help. If someone does revive after CPR, it's still a medical emergency that requires rapid assessment and treatment. The revived person may vomit or may have soiled themselves, and they'll probably be smarting from all those broken ribs, not to mention their heart may stop again. Another aspect of CPR that gets a laughable treatment on film is artificial respiration, or supplying oxygen to a non-breathing patient. TV medicos often overlook this part of it, or do it wrong. If you've taken a first aid class, you'll hopefully remember the part about tilting the head back gently to open the airway, and then pinching shut the nostrils to make sure your breaths actually go into your casualty. Notice how many times this isn't done on TV patients. As an aside, newer guidelines on CPR protocols do now recommend not stopping compressions to put air in for one-person rescuers as better outcomes are achieved when the circulation of the blood and the oxygen it already has in it is maintained through chest compressions alone, instead of stopping and starting. Like priming a pump over and over again, but stopping just short of actually pumping anything. I suspect, though, writers are not thinking of this when they forget to have the medic breathe for their patient during cardiac arrest. Sometimes TV medics do deliver oxygen to the flat-lined patient by squeezing what looks like a transparent football over the patient's mouth. This is an effective way of putting air into someone who needs help breathing, but the way it's portrayed on film is almost never even close to correct. Actors squeeze the life out of the bag like they're pumping up a flat tire. Ironically enough, this is where they put on the speed, not during the chest compressions, probably because it's relatively easy to do. They go so fast, there's no way the bag can fill up with enough air in between squeezes to deliver enough oxygen to the patients. And sometimes it's just the opposite. They squeeze the bag casually once every 10 minutes or so, just to make it look good, I guess. <laughs> Which would do absolutely nothing for the patient, who needs anywhere from 6 to 10 ventilations per minute. Unconscious patients also need an open airway, and if the rescuer can't manually keep the head tilted back, this is usually accomplished via a plastic tube inserted down the throat or down one nostril, and which is so uncomfortable in a conscious person, it's no wonder actors would never put up with it on set. And finally, the really fun part, defibrillators. Ugh, defibrillators, what would we do for drama without defibrillators? Defibrillators and heart monitors in fictional ambulances are often portrayed as incorrectly as they are in fictional ERs. Rubbing the paddles together, for example, yelling clear as if the charge would send anyone who touched it flying across the room. The reality is it's just to prevent someone's jostling from interfering with a 
proper ECG tracing, by the way. And, of course, that famous leap off the stretcher from the jolted patient. Real shocks to the heart look more like hiccups than demonic possession, which doesn't do much for the show's ratings. What's worse, however, is the complete lack of understanding as to what defibrillators actually do. In a nutshell, what you'll most often see is an AED, an automatic external defibrillator, the device you'll find in public places and in most ambulances and first aid stations. It's a simple device. You place two small plastic pads on the patient's chest and rib area, above and below and to the side of the heart, and the machine scans for what's known as a shockable rhythm. If it finds such a rhythm, you press a button and it delivers a jolt, after which you continue with CPR which you should have been doing while digging out the AED. So what rhythms are shockable? Well, it might be easier to describe what isn't shockable. Flatline, or asystole in medicalese, isn't shockable. In fact, a defibrillator is essentially trying to create a temporary flatline, not fix one. A normal sinus rhythm, as in a conscious, healthy person, also isn't shockable. So there's no way to pull a jackass-like prank on your sleeping friend and give them a buzz. Atrial fibrillation, sometimes shortened to AFib, where the top two chambers of the heart quiver like jelly instead of pumping blood down into the bottom two chambers in a nice, regular rhythm, is also not shockable by a public AED. Paramedics often have the equipment and or medications to deal with this by performing cardioversion, but the general public does not. And something called a PEA, pulseless electrical activity, is also not shockable. This is where the heart's electrical impulses are working just fine, but either blood loss or a problem with the heart muscle itself has led to a lack of circulation. There are only two shockable rhythms, ventricle fibrillation, or V-fib, where the bottom two chambers of the heart quiver like jelly instead of pumping blood out to the body, and PVT, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, where those same two bottom chambers don't receive impulses from the heart's primary natural pacemakers and begin to fire rapidly to compensate. This doesn't allow the muscles to contract properly or for those chambers to fill with blood, so eventually the pulse is lost. You can have VTAC with a pulse if the cardiac muscle is able to contract, but that wouldn't be considered cardiac arrest and you wouldn't need a shock. It probably goes without saying that in a hospital setting, all of these conditions can be treated. It's simply that in public situations or in the back of an ambulance, an AED can only do so much. Given this, it's really hard to understand why people in movies can have their hearts restarted by hooking them up to a car battery. Police Story with Jackie Chan and Rob B. Hood, also with Jackie Chan. Or having Jason Statham bite down on the live end of a jumper cable to give himself a quick charge cranked. The King of the Hill animated TV series joked about this too, when Dad Hank asks his son if he knows how to, quote, start a man's heart with a down power line. When Bobby says no, Hank replies, well, there's really no wrong way to do it. (laughs) So there it is, the top five worst medical mistakes on film. I could do endless episodes on this topic. Let me know your favorite medical goof up and maybe I'll do another episode with even more eye-rolling TV medicine. That's it for now. Join me next time for another fascinating look at medicine in history, culture, and the arts.